Chapter Fifteen of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter Fifteen A Tempest in the School Teapot. What a splendid day! said Anne, drawing a long breath. Isn't it good just to be alive on a day like this? I pity the people who aren't born yet for missing it. They may have good days, of course, but they can never have this one. And it's splendider still to have such a lovely way to go to school by, isn't it? It's a lot nicer than going round by the road. That is so dusty and hot, said Diana practically, peeping into her dinner basket and mentally calculating if the three juicy, toothsome raspberry tarts reposing there were divided among ten girls, how many bites each girl would have. The little girls of Avonlea School always pooled their lunches, and to eat three raspberry tarts all alone, or even to share them only with one's best chum, would have forever and ever branded as awful mean the girl who did it. And yet, when the tarts were divided among ten girls, you just got enough to tantalize you. The way Anne and Diana went to school was a pretty one. Anne thought those walks to and from school with Diana couldn't be improved upon even by imagination. Going around by the main road would have been so unromantic, but to go by Lover's Lane and Willowmere and Violet Vale and the Birch Path was romantic, if ever anything was. Lover's Lane opened out below the orchard at Green Gables and stretched far up into the woods to the end of the Cuthbert Farm. It was the way by which the cows were taken to the back pasture and the wood hauled home in winter. Anne had named it Lover's Lane before she had been a month at Green Gables. Not that lovers ever really walk there, she explained to Marilla, but Diana and I are reading a perfectly magnificent book and there's a Lover's Lane in it, so we want to have one too. And it's a very pretty name, don't you think? So romantic. We can imagine the lovers into it, you know. I like that lane because you can think out loud there without people calling you crazy. Anne, starting out alone in the morning, went down Lover's Lane as far as the brook. Here Diana met her, and the two little girls went on up the lane under the leafy arch of maples. Maples are such sociable trees, said Anne. They're always rustling and whispering to you. Until they came to a rustic bridge. Then they left the lane and walked through Mr. Barry's back field and past Willowmere. Beyond Willowmere came Violet Vale, a little green dimple in the shadow of Mr. Andrew Bell's big woods. Of course there are no violets there now, Anne told Marilla, but Diana says there are millions of them in spring. Oh, Marilla, can't you just imagine you see them? It actually takes away my breath. I named it Violet Vale. Diana says she never saw the beat of me for hitting on fancy names for places. It's nice to be clever at something, isn't it? But Diana named the Birch Path. She wanted to, so I let her. But I'm sure I could have found something more poetical than plain Birch Path. Anybody can think of a name like that. But the Birch Path is one of the prettiest places in the world, Marilla. It was. Other people besides Anne thought so when they stumbled on it. It was a little narrow, twisting path, winding down over a long hill straight through Mr. Bell's woods, where the light came down sifted through so many emerald screens that it was as flawless as the heart of a diamond. It was fringed in all its length with slim young birches, white-stemmed and lissom bowed Ferns and star-flowers and wild lilies of the valley and scarlet tufts of pigeon-berries grew thickly along it, and always there was a delightful spiciness in the air, and music of bird calls and the murmur and laugh of wood winds in the trees overhead. Now and then you might see a rabbit skipping across the road if you were quiet, which, with Anne and Diana, happened about once in a blue moon. Down in the valley the path came out to the main road, and then it was just up the spruce hill to the school. The Avonlea school was a whitewashed building, low in the eaves and wide in the windows, furnished inside with comfortable, substantial, old-fashioned desks that opened and shut, and were carved all over their lids with the initials and hieroglyphics of three generations of school children. The schoolhouse was set back from the road, and behind it was a dusky fir wood and a brook where all the children put their bottles of milk in the morning to keep cool and sweet until dinner hour. Marilla had seen Anne start off to school on the first day of September with many secret misgivings. Anne was such an odd girl. 
How would she get on with the other children? And how on earth would she ever manage to hold her tongue during school hours? Things went better than Marilla feared, however. Anne came home that evening in high spirits. "'I think I'm going to like school here,' she announced. "'I don't think much of the master, though. He's all the time curling his mustache and making eyes at Prissy Andrews. Prissy is grown up, you know. She's sixteen and she's studying for the entrance examination into Queen's Academy at Charlottetown next year. Tilly Bolter says the master is dead gone on her. She's got a beautiful complexion and curly brown hair and she does it up so elegantly. She sits in the long seat at the back, and he sits there too most of the time. To explain her lessons, he says. But Ruby Gillis says she saw him writing something on her slate, and when Prissy read it she blushed as red as a beet and giggled, and Ruby Gillis says she doesn't believe it had anything to do with the lesson. And Shirley, don't let me hear you talking about your teacher in that way again, said Marilla sharply. You don't go to school to criticize the master. I guess he can teach you something, and it's your business to learn. And I want you to understand right off that you are not to come home telling tales about him. That is something I won't encourage. I hope you were a good girl." "'Indeed I was,' said Anne comfortably. "'It wasn't so hard as you might imagine, either. I sit with Diana. Our seat is right by the window, and we can look down to the Lake of Shining Waters. There are a lot of nice girls in school, and we had scrumptious fun playing at dinner time. It's so nice to have a lot of little girls to play with. But of course I like Diana best and always will. I adore Diana. I'm dreadfully far behind the others. They're all in the fifth book and I'm only in the fourth. I feel that it's kind of a disgrace. But there's not one of them has such an imagination as I have, and I soon found that out. We had reading and geography and Canadian history and dictation today. Mr. Phillips said my spelling was disgraceful, and he held up my slate so that everybody could see it all marked over. I felt so mortified, Marilla. He might have been politer to a stranger, I think. Ruby Gillis gave me an apple, and Sophia Sloane lent me a lovely pink card with May I See You Home on it. I'm to give it back to her tomorrow. And Tilly Bolter let me wear her bead ring all the afternoon. Can I have some of those pearl beads off the old pincushion in the garret to make myself a ring? And oh, Marilla, Jane Andrews told me that Minnie McPherson told her that she heard Prissy Andrews tell Sarah Gillis that I had a very pretty nose. Marilla, that is the first compliment I have ever had in my life, and you can't imagine what a strange feeling it gave me. Marilla, have I really a pretty nose? I know you'll tell me the truth. Your nose is well enough, said Marilla shortly. Secretly she thought Anne's nose was a remarkably pretty one, but she had no intention of telling her so. That was three weeks ago, and all had gone smoothly so far. And now, this crisp September morning, Anne and Diana were tripping blithely down the birch path, two of the happiest little girls in Avonlea. "'I guess Gilbert Blythe will be in school today,' said Diana. "'He's been visiting his cousins over in New Brunswick all summer, and he only came home Saturday night. He's awfully handsome, Anne, and he teases the girls something terrible. He just torments our lives out." Diana's voice indicated that she rather liked having her life tormented out than not. "'Gilbert Blythe,' said Anne. "'Isn't it his name that's written up on the porch wall with Julia Bells and a big take-notice over them?' "'Yes,' said Diana, tossing her head. "'But I'm sure he doesn't like Julia Bell so very much. I've heard him say he studied the multiplication table by her freckles." "'Oh, don't speak about freckles to me,' implored Anne. "'It isn't delicate when I've got so many. But I do think that writing take notices up on the wall about the boys and girls is the silliest ever. I should just like to see anybody dare to write my name up with the boys. Not, of course," she hastened to add, that anybody would. Anne sighed. She didn't want her name written up, but it was a little humiliating to know that there was no danger of it. Nonsense," said Diana, whose black eyes and glossy tresses had played such havoc with the hearts of Avonlea schoolboys that her name figured on the porch walls in half a dozen take-notices. It's only meant as a joke. And don't you be too sure your name won't ever be written up. Charlie Sloane is dead gone on you. He told his mother, his mother, mind you, that you were the smartest girl in school. That's better than being good-looking." "'No, it isn't,' 
said Anne, feminine to the core. I'd rather be pretty than clever. And I hate Charlie Sloane. I can't bear a boy with goggle eyes. If anyone wrote my name up with his, I'd never get over it, Diana Barry. But it is nice to keep head of your class. You'll have Gilbert in your class after this, said Diana. And he's used to being head of his class, I can tell you. He's only in the fourth book, although he's nearly fourteen. Four years ago his father was sick and had to go out to Alberta for his help, and Gilbert went with him. They were there three years, and Gil didn't go to school hardly any until they came back. You won't find it so easy to keep head after this, Anne. I'm glad, said Anne quickly. I couldn't really feel proud of keeping head of little boys and girls of just nine or ten. I got up yesterday spelling ebullition. Josie Pye was head, and mind you, she peeped in her book. Mr. Phillips didn't see her. He was looking at Prissy Andrews, but I did. I just swept her a look of freezing scorn, and she got as red as a beet and spelled it wrong after all. Those pie girls are cheats all round, said Diana indignantly as they climbed the fence of the main road. Gertie Pye actually went and put her milk bottle in my place in the brook yesterday. Did you ever? I don't speak to her now. When Mr. Phillips was in the back of the room hearing Prissy Andrews's Latin, Diana whispered to Anne, "'That's Gilbert Blythe sitting across the aisle from you, Anne. Just look at him and see if you don't think he's handsome.' Anne looked accordingly. She had a good chance to do so, for the said Gilbert Blythe was absorbed in stealthily pinning the long yellow braid of Ruby Gillis, who sat in front of him, to the back of her seat. He was a tall boy, with curly brown hair, roguish hazel eyes, and a mouth twisted into a teasing smile. Presently Ruby Gillis started up to take a sum to the master. She fell back into her seat with a little shriek, believing that her hair was pulled out by the roots. Everybody looked at her, and Mr. Phillips glared so sternly that Ruby began to cry. Gilbert had whisked the pin out of sight and was studying his history with the soberest face in the world. But when the commotion subsided he looked at Anne and winked with inexpressible drollery. "'I think your Gilbert Blythe is handsome,' confided Anne to Diana but I think he's very bold. It isn't good manners to wink at a strange girl. But it was not until the afternoon that things really began to happen. Mr. Phillips was back in the corner explaining a problem in algebra to Prissy Andrews, and the rest of the scholars were doing pretty much as they pleased, eating green apples, whispering, drawing pictures on their slates, and driving crickets harnessed to strings up and down the aisle. Gilbert Blythe was trying to make Anne Shirley look at him and failing utterly, because Anne was at that moment totally oblivious not only to the very existence of Gilbert Blythe, but of every other scholar in Avonlea School itself. With her chin propped on her hands, and her eyes fixed on the blue glimpse of the lake of shining waters that the west window afforded, she was far away in a gorgeous dreamland, hearing and seeing nothing save her own wonderful visions. Gilbert Blythe wasn't used to putting himself out to make a girl look at him and meeting with failure. She should look at him, that red-haired Shirley girl with the little pointed chin, and the big eyes that weren't like the eyes of any other girl in Avonlea school. Gilbert reached across the aisle, picked up the end of Anne's long red braid, held it out at arm's length, and said in a piercing whisper, "'Carrots! Carrots!' Then Anne looked at him with a vengeance. She did more than look. She sprang to her feet, her bright fancies fallen into cureless ruin. She flashed one indignant glance at Gilbert, from eyes whose angry sparkle was swiftly quenched in equally angry tears. "'You mean, hateful boy!' she exclaimed passionately. "'How dare you!' And then, thwack, Anne had brought her slate down on Gilbert's head and cracked it, slate, not head, clear across. Avonlea School always enjoyed a scene. This was an especially enjoyable one. Everybody said, oh, in horrified delight. Diana gasped. Ruby Gillis, who was inclined to be hysterical, began to cry. Tommy Sloane let his team of crickets escape him altogether while he stared open-mouthed at the tableau. Mr. Phillips stalked down the aisle and laid his hand heavily on Anne's shoulder. Anne Shirley, what does this mean? He said angrily. Anne returned no answer. It was asking too much of flesh and blood to expect her to tell before the whole school that she had been called Carrots. Gilbert it was who spoke up stoutly. It was my fault, Mr. Phillips. 
I teased her. Mr. Phillips paid no heed to Gilbert. I am sorry to see a pupil of mine displaying such a temper and such a vindictive spirit, he said in a solemn tone, as if the mere fact of being a pupil of his ought to root out all evil passions from the hearts of small imperfect mortals. Anne, go and stand on the platform in front of the blackboard for the rest of the afternoon. Anne would have infinitely preferred a whipping to this punishment, under which her sensitive spirit quivered as from a whiplash. With a white, set face she obeyed. Mr. Phillips took a chalk crayon and wrote on the blackboard above her head, Anne Shirley has a very bad temper. Anne Shirley must learn to control her temper. And then read it out loud, so that even the primer class, who couldn't read writing, should understand it. Anne stood there the rest of the afternoon with that legend above her. She did not cry or hang her head. Anger was still too hot in her heart for that, and it sustained her amid all her agony of humiliation. With resentful eyes and passion-red cheeks, she confronted alike Diana's sympathetic gaze and Charlie Sloane's indignant nods and Josie Pye's malicious smiles. As for Gilbert Blythe, she would not even look at him. She would never look at him again. She would never speak to him. When school was dismissed, Anne marched out with her red head held high. Gilbert Blythe tried to intercept her at the porch door. "'I'm awfully sorry I made fun of your hair, Anne.' he whispered contritely. "'Honest I am. Don't be mad for keeps now.' Anne swept by disdainfully without look or sign of hearing. "'Oh, how could you, Anne?' breathed Diana as they went down the road, half reproachfully, half admiringly. Diana felt that she could never have resisted Gilbert's plea. "'I shall never forgive Gilbert Blythe,' said Anne firmly. "'And Mr. Phillips spelled my name without an E, too.' The iron has entered into my soul, Diana. Diana hadn't the least idea what Anne meant, but she understood it was something terrible. You mustn't mind Gilbert making fun of your hair, she said soothingly. Why, he makes fun of all the girls. He laughs at mine because it's so black. He's called me a crow a dozen times, and I never heard him apologize for anything before either. There's a great deal of difference between being called a crow and being called carrots said Anne with dignity. Gilbert Blythe has hurt my feelings excruciatingly, Diana. It is possible the matter might have blown over without more excruciation if nothing else had happened. But when things begin to happen they are apt to keep on. Avonlea scholars often spent noon hour picking gum in Mr. Bell's spruce grove over the hill and across his big pasture field. From there they could keep an eye on Eben Wright's house, where the master boarded. When they saw Mr. Phillips emerging therefrom, they ran for the schoolhouse. But the distance being about three times longer than Mr. Wright's lane, they were very apt to arrive there, breathless and gasping, some three minutes too late. On the following day, Mr. Phillips was seized with one of his spasmodic fits of reform, and announced, before going home to dinner, that he should expect to find all the scholars in their seats when he returned. Anyone who came in late would be punished. All the boys and some of the girls went to Mr. Bell's spruce grove as usual, fully intending to stay only long enough to pick a chew. But spruce groves are seductive, and yellow nuts of gum beguiling. They picked and loitered and strayed, and as usual the first thing that recalled them to a sense of the flight of time was Jimmy Glover shouting from the top of a patriarchal old spruce, "'Master's coming!' The girls, who were on the ground, started first and managed to reach the schoolhouse in time but without a second to spare. The boys, who had to wriggle hastily down from the trees, were later, and Anne, who had not been picking gum at all but was wandering happily in the far end of the grove, waist-deep among the bracken, singing softly to herself, with a wreath of rice lilies on her hair as if she were some wild divinity of the shadowy places, was latest of all. Anne could run like a deer, however. Run she did, with the impish result that she overtook the boys at the door, and was swept into the schoolhouse among them just as Mr. Phillips was in the act of hanging up his hat. Mr. Phillips's brief reforming energy was over. He didn't want the bother of punishing a dozen pupils, but it was necessary to do something to save his word, so he looked about for a scapegoat and found it in Anne, who had dropped into her seat, gasping for breath, with a forgotten lily wreath hanging askew over one ear, and giving her a particularly rakish and disheveled appearance. Anne Shirley, 
since you seem to be so fond of the boy's company we shall indulge your taste for it this afternoon he said sarcastically take those flowers out of your hair and sit with gilbert blythe the other boys snickered diana turning pale with pity plucked the wreath from anne's hair and squeezed her hand anne stared at the master as if turned to stone did you hear what i said anne queried mr phillips sternly yes sir said anne slowly but i didn't suppose you really meant it i assure you i did still with the sarcastic inflection which all the children and anne especially hated it flicked on the raw obey me at once for a moment anne looked as if she meant to disobey then realizing that there was no help for it she rose haughtily stepped across the aisle sat down beside gilbert blythe and buried her face in her arms on the desk ruby gillis who got a glimpse of it as it went down told the others going home from school that she'd actually never seen anything like it it was so white with awful little red spots in it to anne this was as the end of all things it was bad enough to be singled out for punishment from among a dozen equally guilty ones it was worse still to be sent to sit with a boy but that that boy should be gilbert blythe was heaping insult on injury to a degree utterly unbearable anne felt that she could not bear it and it would be of no use to try her whole being seethed with shame and anger and humiliation at first the other scholars looked and whispered and giggled and nudged but as anne never lifted her head and as gilbert worked fractions as if his whole soul was absorbed in them and them only they soon returned to their own tasks and anne was forgotten when mr phillips called the history class out anne should have gone but anne did not move and mr phillips who had been writing some verses to priscilla before he called the class was thinking about an obstinate rhyme still and never missed her once when nobody was looking gilbert took from his desk a little pink candy heart with a gold motto on it you are sweet and slipped it under the curve of anne's arm whereupon anne arose took the pink heart gingerly between the tips of her fingers dropped it on the floor ground it to powder beneath her heel and resumed her position without deigning to bestow a glance on Gilbert. When school went out, Anne marched to her desk, ostentatiously took out everything therein, books and writing tablet, pen and ink, testament and arithmetic, and piled them neatly on her cracked slate. "'What are you taking all those things home for, Anne?' Diana wanted to know as soon as they were out on the road. She had not dared to ask the question before. "'I am not coming back to school any more.' said anne diana gasped and stared at anne to see if she meant it will marilla let you stay home she asked she'll have to said anne i'll never go to school to that man again oh anne diana looked as if she were ready to cry i do think you're mean what shall i do mr phillips will make me sit with that horrid gertie pye i know he will because she's sitting alone do come back anne i do almost anything in the world for you, Diana," said Anne sadly. I'd let myself be torn limb from limb if it would do you any good. But I can't do this, so please don't ask it. You harrow up my very soul. Just think of all the fun you will miss," mourned Diana. We are going to build the loveliest new house down by the brook, and we'll be playing ball next week, and you've never played ball, Anne. It's tremendously exciting, and we're going to learn a new song. Jane Andrews is practicing it up now, and Alice Andrews is going to bring a new pansy book next week, and we're all going to read it out loud, chapter about, down by the brook. And you know you are so fond of reading out loud, Anne. Nothing moved Anne in the least. Her mind was made up. She would not go to school to Mr. Phillips again. She told Marilla so when she got home nonsense said marilla it isn't nonsense at all said anne gazing at marilla with solemn reproachful eyes don't you understand marilla i've been insulted insulted fiddlesticks you'll go to school tomorrow as usual oh no anne shook her head gently i'm not going back marilla i'll learn my lessons at home and i'll be as good as i can be and hold my tongue all the time if it's possible at all but I will not go back to school, I assure you. 
Marilla saw something remarkably like unyielding stubbornness looking out of Anne's small face. She understood that she would have trouble in overcoming it, but she resolved wisely to say nothing more just then. "'I'll run down and see Rachel about it this evening,' she thought. "'There's no use reasoning with Anne now. She's too worked up. And I've an idea she can be awful stubborn if she takes the notion. Far as I can make out from her story, Mr. Phillips has been carrying matters with a rather high hand. But it would never do to say so to her. I'll just talk it over with Rachel. She's sent ten children to school, and she ought to know something about it. She'll have heard the whole story, too, by this time." Marilla found Mrs. Lynde knitting quilts as industriously and cheerfully as usual. "'I suppose you know what I've come about,' she said, a little shamefacedly. Mrs. Rachel nodded. "'About Anne's fuss in school, I reckon.' she said. Tilly Bolter was in on her way home from school and told me about it. I don't know what to do with her, said Marilla. She declares she won't go back to school. I never saw a child so worked up. I've been expecting trouble ever since she started to school. I knew things were going too smooth to last. She's so high-strung. What would you advise, Rachel? Well, since you've asked my advice, Marilla, said Mrs. Lynde amiably. Mrs. Lynde dearly loved to be asked for advice. I'd just humor her a little at first, that's what I'd do. It's my belief that Mr. Phillips was in the wrong. Of course it doesn't do to say so to the children, you know. And of course he did right to punish her yesterday for giving way to temper. But today it was different. The others who were late should have been punished as well as Anne, that's what. And I don't believe in making the girls sit with the boys for punishment. It isn't modest. Tilly Bolter was real indignant. She took Anne's part right through and said all the scholars did too. Anne seems real popular among them somehow. I never thought she'd take with them so well. Then you really think I'd better let her stay home? said Marilla in amazement. Yes. That is, I wouldn't say school to her again until she said it herself. Depend upon it, Marilla. She'll cool off in a week or so and be ready enough to go back of her own accord. That's what. Well, if you were to make her go back right off, dear knows what freak or tantrum she'd take next and make more trouble than ever. The less fuss made, the better, in my opinion. She won't miss much by not going to school, as far as that goes. Mr. Phillips isn't any good at all as a teacher. The order he keeps is scandalous, that's what. And he neglects the young fry and puts all his time on those big scholars he's getting ready for Queens. He'd never have got to school for another year if his uncle hadn't been a trustee. The trustee. For he just leads the other two around by the nose, that's what. I declare I don't know what education in this island is coming to." Mrs. Rachel shook her head, as much as to say if she were only at the head of the educational system of the province, things would be much better managed. Marilla took Mrs. Rachel's advice, and not another word was said to Anne about going back to school. She learned her lessons at home, did her chores, and played with Diana in the chilly purple autumn twilights, but when she met Gilbert Blythe on the road, or encountered him in Sunday school, she passed him by with an icy contempt that was no whit thawed by his evident desire to appease her. Even Diana's efforts as a peacemaker were of no avail. Anne had evidently made up her mind to hate Gilbert Blythe to the end of life. As much as she hated Gilbert, however, did she love Diana, with all the love of her passionate little heart, equally intense in its likes and dislikes. One evening Marilla, coming in from the orchard with a basket of apples, found Anne sitting alone by the east window in the twilight, crying bitterly. "'Whatever's the matter now, Anne?' she asked. "'It's about Diana,' sobbed Anne luxuriously. "'I love Diana so, Marilla. I cannot ever live without her. But I know very well when we grow up that Diana will get married and go away and leave me. And oh, what shall I do? I hate her husband. I just hate him furiously. I've been imagining it all out.' the wedding and everything, Diana dressed in snowy garments with a veil and looking as beautiful and regal as a queen, and me the bridesmaid, with a lovely dress too and puffed sleeves, but with a breaking heart hid beneath my smiling face, and then bidding Diana good-bye. Here Anne broke down entirely and wept with increasing bitterness. Marilla turned quickly away to hide her twitching face, but it was no use. She collapsed on the nearest chair and burst into such a hearty and unusual peal of laughter that Matthew, crossing the yard outside, halted in amazement. When had he heard Marilla laugh like that before? 
"'Well, Anne Shirley,' said Marilla, as soon as she could speak, "'if you must borrow trouble, for pity's sake borrow it handier home. I should think you had an imagination, sure enough.'" End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter Sixteen Diana is invited to tea with tragic results. October was a beautiful month at Green Gables when the birches in the hollow turned as golden as sunshine, and the maples behind the orchard were royal crimson, and the wild cherry trees along the lane put on the loveliest shades of dark red and bronzy green, while the fields sunned themselves in aftermaths. Anne reveled in the world of color about her. "'Oh, Marilla!' she exclaimed one Saturday morning, coming dancing in with her arms full of gorgeous boughs. I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. It would be terrible if we just skipped from September to November, wouldn't it? Look at these maple branches. Don't they give you a thrill? Several thrills. I'm going to decorate my room with them." "'Messy things,' said Marilla, whose aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed. "'You clutter up your room entirely too much with out-of-doors stuff, Anne. Bedrooms are made to sleep in. Oh, and dream in too, Marilla. And you know one can dream so much better in a room where there are pretty things. I'm going to put these boughs in the old blue jug and set them on my table. Mind you don't drop leaves all over the stairs, then. I'm going on a meeting of the Aid Society at Carmody this afternoon, Anne, and I won't likely be home before dark. You'll have to get Matthew and Jerry their supper, so mind you don't forget to put the tea to draw until you sit down at the table as you did last time." It was dreadful of me to forget," said Anne apologetically. But that was the afternoon I was trying to think of a name for Violet Vale, and it crowded other things out. Matthew was so good. He never scolded a bit. He put the tea down himself and said we could wait a while as well as not. And I told him a lovely fairy story while we were waiting, so he didn't find the time long at all. It was a beautiful fairy story, Marilla. I forgot the end of it, so I made up an end for it myself, and Matthew said he couldn't tell where the join came in." "'Matthew would think it all right, Anne, if you took a notion to get up and have dinner in the middle of the night. But you keep your wits about you this time. And I don't really know if I'm doing right. It may make you more addle-pated than ever. But you can ask Diana to come over and spend the afternoon with you and have tea here." "'Oh, Marilla!' Anne clasped her hands. How perfectly lovely! You are able to imagine things after all, or else you'd never have understood how I've longed for that very thing. It will seem so nice and grown-uppish. No fear of my forgetting to put the tea to draw when I have company. Oh, Marilla, can I use the rosebud spray tea set? No, indeed. The rosebud tea set? Well, what next? You know I never use that except for the minister or the aides. You'll put down the old brown tea set. But you can open the little yellow crock of cherry preserves. It's time it was being used anyhow. I believe it's beginning to work. And you can cut some fruit cake and have some of the cookies and snaps." "'I can just imagine myself sitting down at the head of the table and pouring out the tea,' said Anne, shutting her eyes ecstatically, and asking Diana if she takes sugar. I know she doesn't, but of course I'll ask her just as if I didn't know and then pressing her to take another piece of fruit cake and another helping of preserves. Oh, Marilla, it's a wonderful sensation just to think of it. Can I take her into the spare room to lay off her hat when she comes, and then into the parlor to sit?" No, the sitting room will do for you and your company. But there's a bottle half full of raspberry cordial that was left over from the church social the other night. It's on the second shelf of the sitting room closet, and you and Diana can have it if you like and a cookie to eat with it along in the afternoon, for I dare say Matthew'll be late coming in to tea, since he's hauling potatoes to the vessel." Anne flew down the hollow, past the Dryad's bubble and up the spruce path to Orchard Slope, to ask Diana to tea. As a result, just after Marilla had driven off to Carmody, Diana came over, dressed in her second-best dress, 
and looking exactly as it is proper to look when asked out to tea. At other times she was wont to run into the kitchen without knocking, but now she knocked primly at the front door. And when Anne, dressed in her second best, as primly opened it, both little girls shook hands as gravely as if they had never met before. This unnatural solemnity lasted until after Diana had been taken to the east gable to lay off her hat, and then had sat for ten minutes in the sitting-room, toes in position. "'How is your mother?' inquired Anne politely, just as if she had not seen Mrs. Berry picking apples that morning in excellent health and spirits. "'She is very well, thank you. I suppose Mr. Cuthbert is hauling potatoes to the lily sands this afternoon, is he?' said Diana, who had ridden down to Mr. Harmon Andrews's that morning in Matthew's cart. "'Yes. Our potato crop is very good this year. I hope your father's crop is good, too.' "'It is fairly good, thank you. Have you picked many of your apples yet?' "'Oh, ever so many,' said Anne, forgetting to be dignified and jumping up quickly. "'Let's go out to the orchard and get some of the red sweetings, Diana. Marilla says we can have all that are left on the tree. Marilla is a very generous woman. She said we could have fruit cake and cherry preserves for tea. But it isn't good manners to tell your company what you are going to give them to eat, so I won't tell you what she said we could have to drink. Only it begins with an R and a C and it's a bright red color. I love bright red drinks, don't you? They taste twice as good as any other color. The orchard, with its great sweeping boughs that bent to the ground with fruit, proved so delightful that the little girls spent most of the afternoon in it, sitting in a grassy corner where the frost had spared the green, and the mellow autumn sunshine lingered warmly, eating apples and talking as hard as they could. Diana had much to tell Anne of what went on in school. She had to sit with Gertie Pye and she hated it. Gertie squeaked her pencil all the time and it just made her, Diana's, blood run cold. Ruby Gillis had charmed all her warts away, choose you live, with a magic pebble that old Mary Joe from the creek gave her. You had to rub the warts with the pebble, and then throw it away over your left shoulder at the time of the new moon and the warts would all go. Charlie Sloane's name was written up with M. White's on the porch wall, and M. White was awful mad about it. Sam Boulter had sassed Mr. Phillips in class, and Mr. Phillips whipped him, and Sam's father came down to the school and dared Mr. Phillips to lay a hand on one of his children again, and Mattie Andrews had a new red hood and a blue crossover with tassels on it, and the airs she put on about it were perfectly sickening, and Lizzie Wright didn't speak to Mamie Wilson, because Mamie Wilson's grown-up sister had cut out Lizzie Wright's grown-up sister with her bow and everybody missed Anne so and wished she'd come to school again, and Gilbert Blythe. But Anne didn't want to hear about Gilbert Blythe. She jumped up hurriedly and said suppose they go in and have some raspberry cordial. Anne looked on the second shelf of the room pantry, but there was no bottle of raspberry cordial there. Search revealed it away back on the top shelf. Anne put it on a tray and set it on the table with a tumbler. "'Now please help yourself, Diana,' she said politely. I don't believe I'll have any just now. I don't feel as if I wanted any after all those apples." Diana poured herself out a tumblerful, looked at its bright red hue admiringly, and then sipped it daintily. "'That's awfully nice raspberry cordial, Anne,' she said. "'I didn't know raspberry cordial was so nice.' "'I'm real glad you like it. Take as much as you want. I'm going to run out and stir the fire up. There are so many responsibilities on a person's mind when they're keeping house, isn't there?" When Anne came back from the kitchen, Diana was drinking her second glassful of cordial, and, being entreated thereto by Anne, she offered no particular objection to the drinking of a third. The tumblerfuls were generous ones, and the raspberry cordial was certainly very nice. "'The nicest I ever drank,' said Diana. "'It's ever so much nicer than Mrs. Lynde's although she brags of hers so much. It doesn't taste a bit like hers." "'I should think Marilla's raspberry cordial would probably be much nicer than Mrs. Lynde's," said Anne loyally. "'Marilla is a famous cook. She is trying to teach me to cook, but I assure you, Diana, it is uphill work. There's so little scope for imagination in cookery. You just have to go by rules. The last time I made a cake I forgot to put the flour in. I was thinking the loveliest story about you and me, Diana. 
I thought you were desperately ill with smallpox and everybody deserted you, but I went boldly to your bedside and nursed you back to life. And then I took the smallpox and died, and I was buried under those poplar trees in the graveyard, and you planted a rosebush by my grave and watered it with your tears. And you never, never forgot the friend of your youth who sacrificed her life for you. Oh, it was such a pathetic tale, Diana. The tears just rained down over my cheeks while I mixed the cake. But I forgot the flour, and the cake was a dismal failure. Flour is so essential to cakes, you know. Marilla was very cross, and I don't wonder. I'm a great trial to her. She was terribly mortified about the pudding sauce last week. We had a plum pudding for dinner on Tuesday, and there was half the pudding and a pitcherful of sauce left over. Marilla said there was enough for another dinner, and told me to set it on the pantry shelf and cover it. I meant to cover it just as much as could be, Diana, but when I carried it in I was imagining I was a nun. Of course I'm a Protestant, but I imagined I was a Catholic. Taking the veil to bury a broken heart in cloistered seclusion, and I forgot all about covering the pudding sauce. I thought of it next morning and ran to the pantry. Diana, fancy if you can my extreme horror at finding a mouse drowned in that pudding sauce. I lifted the mouse out with a spoon and threw it out in the yard and then I washed the spoon in three waters. Marilla was out milking, and I fully intended to ask her when she came in if I'd give the sauce to the pigs. But when she did come in I was imagining that I was a frost fairy, going through the woods turning the trees red and yellow, whichever they wanted to be. So I never thought about the pudding sauce again, and Marilla sent me out to pick apples. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Chester Ross from Spencerville came here that morning. You know they are very stylish people, especially Mrs. Chester Ross. When Marilla called me in, dinner was all ready and everybody was at the table. I tried to be as polite and dignified as I could be, for I wanted Mrs. Chester Ross to think I was a ladylike little girl, even if I wasn't pretty. Everything went right, until I saw Marilla coming in with the plum pudding in one hand and the pitcher of pudding sauce warmed up in the other. Diana, that was a terrible moment. I remembered everything and I just stood up in my place and shrieked out, Marilla, you mustn't use that pudding sauce. There was a mouse drowned in it. I forgot to tell you before. Oh, Diana, I shall never forget that awful moment if I live to be a hundred. Mrs. Chester Ross just looked at me, and I thought I would sink through the floor with mortification. She is such a perfect housekeeper, and fancy what she must have thought of us. Marilla turned as red as fire, but she never said a word. Then, she just carried that sauce and pudding out and brought in some strawberry preserves. She even offered me some, but I couldn't swallow a mouthful. It was like heaping coals of fire on my head. After Mrs. Chester Ross went away, Marilla gave me a dreadful scolding. Why, Diana, what is the matter? Diana had stood up very unsteadily. Then she sat down again, putting her hands to her head. I'm... I'm awful sick she said, a little thickly. I... I must go right home. Oh, you mustn't dream of going home without your tea, cried Anne in distress. I'll get it right off. I'll go and put the tea down this very minute. I must go home, repeated Diana, stupidly but determinedly. Let me get you a lunch anyhow, implored Anne. Let me give you a bit of fruit cake and some of the cherry preserves. Lie down on the sofa for a little while and you'll be better. Where do you feel bad? I must go home, said Diana, and that was all she would say. In vain Anne pleaded. I never heard of company going home without tea, she mourned. Oh, Diana, do you suppose that it's possible you're really taking the smallpox? If you are, I'll go and nurse you. You can depend on that. I'll never forsake you. But I do wish you'd stay till after tea. Where do you feel bad? I'm awful dizzy," said Diana. And indeed she walked very dizzily. Anne, with tears of disappointment in her eyes, got Diana's hat and went with her as far as the berry yard fence. Then she wept all the way back to Green Gables, where she sorrowfully put the remainder of the raspberry cordial back in the pantry and got tea ready for Matthew and Jerry, with all the zest gone out of the performance. The next day was Sunday and as the rain poured down in torrents from dawn till dusk, Anne did not stir abroad from Green Gables. 
Monday afternoon, Marilla sent her down to Mrs. Lynde's on an errand. In a very short space of time, Anne came flying back up the lane with tears rolling down her cheeks. Into the kitchen she dashed and flung herself face downward on the sofa in an agony. "'Whatever has gone wrong now, Anne?' queried Marilla in doubt and dismay. "'I do hope you haven't gone and been saucy to Mrs. Lynde again.' No answer from Anne save more tears and stormier sobs. "'Anne Shirley, when I ask you a question I want to be answered. Sit right up this very minute and tell me what you are crying about." Anne sat up, tragedy personified. "'Mrs. Lynde was up to see Mrs. Barry today, and Mrs. Barry was in an awful state,' she wailed. "'She says that I set Diana drunk Saturday and sent her home in a disgraceful condition. And she says that I must be a thoroughly bad, wicked little girl, and she's never, never going to let Diana play with me again. Oh, Marilla, I'm just overcome with woe." Marilla stared in blank amazement. "'Set Diana drunk?' she said when she found her voice. "'Anne, are you or Mrs. Barry crazy? What on earth did you give her?' "'Not a thing but raspberry cordial,' sobbed Anne. I never thought raspberry cordial would set people drunk, Marilla. Not even if they drank three big tumblerfuls as Diana did. Oh, it sounds so, so like Mrs. Thomas's husband. But I didn't mean to set her drunk. Drunk fiddlesticks, said Marilla, marching to the sitting room pantry. There on the shelf was a bottle which she at once recognized as one containing some of her three-year-old homemade currant wine, for which she was celebrated in Avonlea, although certain of the stricter sort, Mrs. Barry among them, disapproved strongly of it. And at the same time Marilla recollected that she had put the bottle of raspberry cordial down in the cellar, instead of in the pantry as she had told Anne. She went back to the kitchen with the wine bottle in her hand. Her face was twitching in spite of herself. Anne, you certainly have a genius for getting into trouble. You went and gave Diana currant wine instead of raspberry cordial. Didn't you know the difference yourself?" "'I never tasted it,' said Anne. I thought it was the cordial. I meant to be so, so hospitable. Diana got awfully sick and had to go home. Mrs. Barry told Mrs. Lynde she was simply dead drunk. She just laughed silly-like when her mother asked her what was the matter, and went to sleep and slept for hours. Her mother smelled her breath and knew she was drunk. She had a fearful headache all day yesterday. Mrs. Barry is so indignant. She will never believe but what I did it on purpose." "'I should think she would better punish Diana for being so greedy as to drink three glassfuls of anything,' said Marilla shortly. "'Why, three of those big glasses would have made her sick even if it had only been cordial. Well, this story will be a nice handle for those folks who were so down on me for making currant wine, although I haven't made any for three years, ever since I found out that the minister didn't approve. I just kept that bottle for sickness." "'There, there, child, don't cry. I can't see as you were to blame, although I'm sorry it happened so." "'I must cry,' said Anne. My heart is broken. The stars in their courses fight against me, Marilla. Diana and I are parted forever. Oh, Marilla, I little dreamed of this when first we swore our vows of friendship." "'Don't be foolish, Anne. Mrs. Barry will think better of it when she finds you're not to blame. I suppose she thinks you've done it for a silly joke or something of that sort. You'd best go up this evening and tell her how it was." "'My courage fails me at the thought of facing Diana's injured mother,' sighed Anne. "'I wish you'd go, Marilla. You're so much more dignified than I am. Likely she'd listen to you quicker than to me." "'Well, I will,' said Marilla, reflecting that it would probably be the wiser course. "'Don't cry any more, Anne. It will be all right.'" Marilla had changed her mind about it being all right by the time she got back from Orchard Slope. Anne was watching for her coming and flew to the porch door to meet her. "'Oh, Marilla, I know by your face that it's been no use,' she said sorrowfully. "'Mrs. Barry won't forgive me?' "'Mrs. Barry, indeed!' snapped Marilla. "'Of all the unreasonable women I ever saw, she's the worst. I told her it was all a mistake and you weren't to blame, but she just simply didn't believe me. And she rubbed it well in about my currant wine, and how I'd always said it couldn't have the least effect on anybody. 
I just told her plainly that currant wine wasn't meant to be drunk three tumblerfuls at a time, and that if a child I had to do with was so greedy, I'd sober her up with a right good spanking." Marilla whisked into the kitchen, grievously disturbed, leaving a very much distracted little soul in the porch behind her. Presently Anne stepped out bareheaded into the chill autumn dusk. Very determinedly and steadily she took her way, down through the sear clover field over the log bridge and up through the spruce grove, lighted by a pale little moon hanging low over the western woods. Mrs. Barry, coming to the door in answer to a timid knock, found a white-lipped, eager-eyed suppliant on the doorstep. Her face hardened. Mrs. Barry was a woman of strong prejudices and dislikes, and her anger was of the cold, sullen sort which is always hardest to overcome. To do her justice, she really believed Anne had made Diana drunk out of sheer malice prepense, and she was honestly anxious to preserve her little daughter from the contamination of further intimacy with such a child. "'What do you want?' she said stiffly. Anne clasped her hands. "'Oh, Mrs. Barry, please forgive me. I did not mean to—to to intoxicate Diana. How could I? Just imagine if you were a poor little orphan girl that kind people had adopted, and you had just one bosom friend in all the world. Do you think you would intoxicate her on purpose? I thought it was only raspberry cordial. I was firmly convinced it was raspberry cordial. Oh, please don't say that you won't let Diana play with me any more. If you do, you will cover my life with a dark cloud of woe." This speech, which would have softened good Mrs. Lynde's heart in a twinkling, had no effect on Mrs. Barry except to irritate her still more. She was suspicious of Anne's big words and dramatic gestures, and imagined that the child was making fun of her. So she said, coldly and cruelly, "'I don't think you are a fit little girl for Diana to associate with. You'd better go home and behave yourself.' Anne's lips quivered. "'Won't you let me see Diana just once to say farewell?' she implored. "'Diana has gone over to Carmody with her father.' said Mrs. Barry, going in and shutting the door. Anne went back to Green Gables, calm with despair. "'My last hope is gone,' she told Marilla. "'I went up and saw Mrs. Barry myself, and she treated me very insultingly. Marilla, I do not think she is a well-bred woman. There is nothing more to do except to pray, and I haven't much hope that that'll do much good, because, Marilla, I do not believe that God himself can do very much with such an obstinate person as Mrs. Barry." "'Anne, you shouldn't say such things,' rebuked Marilla, striving to overcome that unholy tendency to laughter which she was dismayed to find growing upon her. And indeed, when she told the whole story to Matthew that night, she did laugh heartily over Anne's tribulations. But when she slipped into the east gable before going to bed, and found that Anne had cried herself to sleep, an unaccustomed softness crept into her face. "'Poor little soul,' she murmured, lifting a loose curl of hair from the child's tear-stained face. Then she bent down and kissed the flushed cheek on the pillow. End of chapter 16